Hello, it's Scott Manley here. On Christmas Day, I was getting into the Christmas cheer until uh, this tweet from SpaceX came along and kind of, well, made me legitimately sad for a booster which had failed to return to port. This was NASA's life-leading booster, booster number 1058. And it stood out in the fleet, not just because it had launched and landed more times than anything else, but it was the first Falcon 9 booster to carry humans. It rolled out in early 2020, fresh out of the factory. A fresh booster because, yeah, it was going to be carrying this very important mission. And it generated a bit of a buzz in the older spaceflight community as it signaled the return of the worm. The NASA logo generally doesn't appear on rocket boosters, but both the worm and the meatball adorned this very important launch vehicle. And we should note just how clean that pristine booster looked. Because, of course, as that booster flew through its 19 flights, the logos, the markings, they all became obscured under a thick layer of soot from the repeated landing burns. So of the 19 flights, the first one was on May 30th, uh, 2020. It was Crew Demo 2. They followed that up by Anasys 2 in July. There was a Starlink launch followed by CRS-21, a cargo transport to the space station. Then Transporter-1, yes, SpaceX's highly successful rideshare service really began on this booster. There were four more Starlink launches, another Transporter launch, and then the rest of its career was spent lobbing Starlink satellites into orbit. Its penultimate flight was on November 4th, and 49 days later, it was once again on the pad, ready to throw another batch of Starlink satellites into orbit. And it did it successfully, showing that the booster could perform right up to the end of its career. Over 19 flights, it launched a total of 260 tons, which is more than half the mass of the International Space Station. And on each one of those flights, it also had to perform this rocket-powered landing. In this case, it was targeting the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, which was parked out in the middle of the Atlantic. And we get a fantastic view of this whole event all the way down. We're not having those signal dropouts that we used to have now that we have more reliable you know, satellite internet, huh? So importantly, the booster did not fail. We haven't really seen the limits on what boosters can do when they are properly maintained and refurbished between flights. But on the way back to port, it encountered heavy seas. According to the weather reports, the swell may have been as high as 10 to 20 feet. And while the booster was supported by the landing legs and secured but to the deck by Octograbber, clearly the conditions encountered were too much for this, and the booster toppled and broke in half just above the bulkhead to the oxygen tank. And yeah, I'm sorry to say if you were a fan of the worm logo, that probably is sitting at the bottom of the Atlantic now. So yeah, these photos are from John Krause, who took a plane out along with uh, Julia Bergeron and Max Evans, so uh, yeah, that's a pretty cool flight on its own. And so, you know, this isn't an entirely risk-free flight taking a small plane several miles off the coast. So, you know, absolute respect to all the photographers covering this. But yeah, I did specifically ask John Krause if I could use his photos and, you know, check out his website, johnkrausephotos.com, sells calendars and pictures and everything else. But anyway, this particular angle gives you a better idea of what might have happened. This is obviously the booster laying on its side and the octograbber which rides on the drone ship. This sits in a garage uh, and waits for the landing to happen and then it rolls out, drives underneath it and secures the booster to the deck. And I think it does this mostly by weight. The booster has most of the mass in the rear of the vehicle and then this just adds more to keep it stable on the deck. And critically, if you look at the top left, there are chains hanging from the attach point, which tells me that they couldn't mate the usual uh, latch system to that. One reason they might have had to use a chain would be if that corner of the rocket was sitting too high for the grabber to latch on, possibly because the landing legs on the opposite side were sitting too low. And if you look at the final telescoping section of each of the legs that we can see, the one on the left is basically compressed down to nothing. Now, whether this was the result of a landing or the result of falling over, we can't tell. But this is consistent with a booster not standing up straight when it landed. 
And if you compare the video feeds just after landing, the one on the left was a uh, Booster 1058, and it does appear to be leaning a little to the left. However, it is slightly to the left of frame, and it's not entirely impossible that that could just be uh, down to lens distortion. But if it's not, that is consistent with the direction that it appeared to have fallen in. So it's possible that because the barge was pitching and rolling a little, that one or more of the landing legs hit the deck a little harder, compressed a little more, and put a bit of a lean on the booster. We've seen this happen before. There was a lot, one landing in the pre-Octagrabber days where the booster ended up kind of wandering around the deck because it hit a little hard and uh, compressed one of the legs more than others. And even after Octagrabber came online, it wasn't compatible with the center cores of Falcon Heavy. And the center core that was used to launch Arabsat uh, suffered pretty much the same fate, falling over and breaking halfway up the tank. Once it returned to port, we got some more images, and there's a lot to see in these. First of all, yeah, if you look at the top left at the 10 o'clock position, you can see that latch point where the chain is attached. But also look at the three engines across the middle there with white markings on the inside. Now, it's well known that during landing, they will use three engines and then a single engine. So these are the ones which presumably burned last. And the other ones were largely passive during the descent. So it's understandable that they get covered in black suit from the other three. But what I find really curious is that the white sort of splash patterns are pretty much all aligned between these three engines. And truthfully, I don't know enough about the Merlin engine to specifically say why this might be, but it stands out for me. We know that the engine injector is a, a Pintle-style injector, which should, use, should produce circularly symmetric patterns. So I don't think this is a part of the injector. It might be part of the ignition system, which, you know, squirts in T-TEP, right? Triethyl aluminium, triethyl borane. And... If those are, there's no reason for those to be symmetrical, otherwise they'd have to be integrated into the injector. But if those are injecting from both sides of the engine, they might produce these kind of patterns. These engines are being lit and uh, shut down more than the others, and they're running for shorter periods of time. So it's possibly a deposit related to this ignition mechanism. From this angle, you can also see that uh, a handful of the engines have had their engine bells dented, and they're all sort of on the bottom right of this picture. The ones on the top left are largely undamaged. And again, that's what you'd expect if it sort of fell in that direction. Now, if we flip it around to another angle that John got, you can see up inside the fuel tank, which is a place we don't usually see. One thing you'll notice, for example, is that the walls of the tank don't use like an isogrid or an orthogrid that's machined in. Instead, they use stringers, which are welded onto the surface. You can also see a, a few black composite overwrapped pressure vessels. And I'm presuming that these are for nitrogen that is used in the reaction control thrusters for booster recovery. There are also helium pressure vessels, but those are in the liquid oxygen tank. If you put compressed nitrogen cylinders into the liquid oxygen tank, then they would be very close to their liquefaction point, and that's not ideal if you need the stuff to be in gas form for their thrusters. On the top left, you can see where the raceway is broken. That's carrying uh, the electrical connections and things like pneumatics and other control uh, you know, conduits up the side of the rocket. And again, inside the tank, pointing towards the bottom right, you can see the pipe, right, the downcomer that carries liquid oxygen through the fuel tank towards the engine section. But most interestingly, immediately in front of this, you can see fence posts, right, railings, you know, where they would string chains along the edge of the barge. And there's one that's basically sticking up right in line with the booster. Why hasn't this been demolished when you can see to the right of that that the posts are missing, presumably destroyed by the booster falling on top of them? And I think this is a sign that the booster actually fell slightly over to the right and then rolled to the left here. Because if you look at the material inside it, the tanks and the downcomer, they've all sort of uh, shifted over to the right as if that was the direction of the impact. And then I think the whole thing rotated into position. Also, one other thing to look at this photo is you can see the side of the rocket is actually pretty shiny, even although it is black from all that soot. So the soot still leaves a nice shiny surface. Anyway, shifting the view over, you can see down the side of the tank how it's actually split and torn. 
and peeking through the crack you'll get a better view of the side of the oxygen downcomer. It also shows a great comparison between the black soot covered surface and the whiter area which is protected by the landing the legs until right at the very end when the legs deploy. So anyway coming around the back here one of the things I can see is that this octograbber leg really hasn't let go it has just locked on there and it's literally like tin can opener you know cut itself into the side of the uh you know the section at the bottom of the rocket and you can see by the way this rocket nozzle is compressed that it's been squished from below and pushed into the one above it that's probably pushing against one of the arms of the octo grabber now sean cannon captured this interesting image where you can actually see the leg that has been crushed and if you zoom in on that specific section you can see the top uh, segment of the strut is sticking out sideways and it's been snapped. So the strut has actually broken as this thing fell. Or possibly the strut failing is what led to the fall. So yeah, this is unfortunate. And there are already a multitude of self-appointed experts on the internet who are saying that SpaceX brought this upon themselves for being stupid enough to transport boosters around like this on the high seas. But let's be clear, SpaceX knew this. You're not telling them anything. SpaceX has probably looked at the various possibilities. Do they bring a giant crane out into the middle of the ocean? Or do they just bring it back and accept the risk, accept that, you know, in the hundreds of landings that they've performed, that perhaps some of them will fall over? And that maybe the rate at which they fall over isn't enough to justify moving a giant system out into the middle of the ocean to put them on their sides. But at any rate, Booster 1058 is a casualty and that saddens me because it was the booster that brought uh, humans back into space on an American rocket. People from SpaceX have said that they will attempt to recover or salvage materials from this, like the engines which may work. But I hope that whatever pieces come out of it, some of it at least makes it to a museum. In particular, they could cut up that tank and give out sections that have been you know, covered in layers and layers of suits to, uh, from the re-entries. Give those to a whole bunch of museums. What a great you know, artifact to have. Boosters haven't had the same level of love as, say, a space shuttle. But when you think about it, um, 1058 actually flew more times than Challenger. More times than Mercury, more times than Gemini, and more times than the Saturn V. And then the question is, which booster will be the one to start setting new records? And that's probably going to be 1060, which is scheduled to launch in a few days' time on another Starlink mission. And it's launched 17 times. That will make it 18 by the end of the year. And maybe by a couple of months' time, we will see it hit 20. And I look forward to that. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>